Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Risa Galyuba. I'm the Dean here at the University of Virginia Law School. Uh, I am also a faculty senior fellow at the Miller Center and a legal historian. I am so pleased to be moderating today's discussion and I thank everyone in the audience who is uh, joining us. I know this is gonna be a fascinating conversation uh, about race and presidential politics and presidential leadership. Hard to imagine a more timely conversation. The ongoing national reckoning with race that has been uh, prompted by the protests of the past spring and summer uh, have converged with this uh, presidential election season. And the questions that we'll be talking about today uh, are really uh, right front and center at many of the ongoing conversations at the national and local levels. Um, so our conversation today is meant to uh, help us all better understand the current moment by delving into the past as a historian. That's something I uh, want to do. And there's no one better to do it with uh, than our uh, two speakers today. So the kinds of things we'll be talking about today are, you know, what are the lessons that we can take from the past uh, politics and rhetoric and what other presidents administrations have, uh, uh, how they've responded to movements for racial equality, how they've interacted uh, with minorities in uh, throughout American history. Where do we see, I think the essence of today is, where do we see similarities? Where do we see differences? Where are their precedents and where are their uh, <clears throat> divergences? So uh, before I introduce our two panelists, let me just um, provide a few logistics about today's event. <clears throat> um, this will be a moderated conversation, um, and I hope that it will be a true conversation, not only between the three of us, but also uh, with those of you in the audience. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit uh, any questions that you may have. Um, and I will be monitoring the Q&A screen. I will try to enter, um, uh, intersperse your questions into our conversation. And uh, if that turns out to be really hard, I'll do them at the end, but I'm gonna try to make it a true conversation uh, with all of us. And let me just say um, how thrilled I am to be here in my senior fellow at the Miller Center capacity uh, and uh, how wonderful it is to work with the folks at the Miller Center. And uh, thank you to everyone who made uh, this program possible. So our panelists today are Kevin Gaines and Russell Riley. Kevin K. Gaines is a Julian Bond Professor of Civil Rights and Social Justice at the University of Virginia. He is also a Miller Center Senior Fellow and he teaches in the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies. He is the author of several prize winning books uh, and his current research focuses on the problems and projects of racial integration in the United States during and after the Civil Rights Movement. Russell Riley is co-chair of the Miller Center's Presidential Oral History Program. He is the White Burkett Miller Center Professor of Ethics and Institutions. Uh, he too is the author of many books and he is one of the nation's foremost authorities on the contemporary presidency. So I'm thrilled to have both Kevin and Russell here today uh, to anchor our discussion and provide their expertise. So uh, thanks to you both uh, for being part of the conversation and welcome. Uh, Thank you. So um, uh, most of our, I think a lot of our conversation will be uh, about contemporary issues and kind of tacking back and forth between uh, the current administration and, uh, and more recent administrations. But before we get to the late 20th, early 21st centuries, um, I thought it would be helpful to go back a little bit and, uh, and set the stage so that we can better understand uh, the deeper background. So my first question to you, Russell, you have written a book uh, about the presidency and race in the 19th century. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how presidents have exercised their power in response to efforts for racial equality, in response to minorities, you know, kind of over the long sweep of, uh, of American history? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. I'm happy to be in uh, this luminous company uh, today. And Risa, I hope that uh, although you didn't read your own uh, CV, that you'll agree to uh, to to help us tangle with some of these important issues because uh, uh, you're as accomplished in this field as uh, either of the two of us, uh, I think. Um, I, I do think it's important to, to go back into history before we get uh, to the current stage to understand something about the presidential institution. And the book that I wrote began with a premise that if you tell people that you're interested in race in the presidency, there's a sort of an immediate assumption that uh, presidents are, 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 are leading figures in civil rights, that this is something that comes natural to uh, the institution. 
And uh, there is a, you know, there's a certain logic to that because we do, uh, in thinking back uh, popularly at American history, it's natural to think about the great emancipator when you're thinking about the story of the emancipation of the slaves. It's natural for people interested in 20th century history to uh, look at what happened in the 1960s uh, and see that there were uh, important uh, uh, exercises of presidential leadership to help secure uh, civil rights and voting rights uh, uh, in that time. But uh, that overlooks an awful lot of history. And the conclusion that I reached in the book was that, uh, in fact, the presidency is not uh, normally an institution uh, used as a champion for minority rights. And in fact, if you want to flip that and be a little bit more pointed with it, the argument that I've made is that if you look at the history of the presidency over time, in fact, that presidents have, uh, have most commonly, over the long span of American history, used their powers in ways to impair movements towards uh, racial equality. And this is particularly true with respect to Black-white relations. I mean, it's uh, no secret for people who live uh, in the Charlottesville area, if you go to Monticello or Montpelier now, uh, we know that these were slaveholders and these were people who created a constitution that uh, embedded slavery in it. And, they, uh, and although they, there may have been concerns on Jefferson's part about the, uh, the long-term consequences of slavery, they didn't do very much with their powers to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deal with the question of slavery at that time. More to the point, uh, the argument that I make in the book is that you've got a, uh, an enduring movement for abolitionism that begins in the 1830s and runs through the Civil War, uh, in which the, uh, each successive president from Andrew Jackson on is very specifically uh, targeted uh, with efforts to try to suppress those people who were pushing for racial equality, beginning with Jackson, who through Amos Kendall tries to shut down the Postal Service to uh, abolitionist publications. Martin Van Buren, who, um, uh, who issues a preemptive veto order at a time when this was never done on a policy issue, saying that he would not uh, stand for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia because the abolitionists had started a massive movement to petition for um, uh, the abolition uh, uh, in DC. And tracking on through um, uh, Lincoln, this is true. And then after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, uh, you actually see something very similar happening in the 20th century. There is a long civil rights movement that begins in the 20s and 30s in a sort of nascent form. And uh, what you see in the 20th century is presidents trying to manipulate the interior politics of those movements to channel them into the least, um, uh, the least effective forms uh, until uh, uh, you know, people like uh, uh, Dr. King and others are successful in creating a mass movement for the, uh, uh, for the changes in, in, in the 1960s. So that's the kind of history that doesn't cut, it, it sort of, it, it jangles against our perceptions of what American politics is all about, the land of the free and the home of the brave and the idea that presidents are leaders on race. But in fact, the long history indicates something different. Thank you, Russell. And Kevin, I want, what would you, what, how would you add to that or, or change that perspective? Yes, thanks so much, Risa. Um, I think what I would add is the, um, the presidential politics of race was really shaped by uh, the moment uh, around World War II when the African-American vote was, was, was recognized as a force to be reckoned with in politics. Um, since the great migration of the 1920s uh, and the mass migration of hundreds of thousands of African-Americans from the South to Northern cities, such as Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, uh, New York, et cetera, African-Americans constituted a uh, significant voting bloc within these uh, many Midwestern swing states uh, like Illinois. And so the first presidential, uh, the, well, the first president to actually recognize that and to uh, seek out the African-American vote was Harry Truman. And Truman uh, was gonna be in a close election in 1948 
and he issued uh, a, uh, a, a study called To Secure These Rights. For the first time, a, a, a leader of a major American political party backed what was pretty much the whole civil rights agenda. And so um, that uh, recognition of the black vote as perhaps being decisive in such states as Illinois or Michigan uh, or Ohio, um, well, I think Truman did the right thing and he, he, he made that calculation and he was able to, to win uh, election narrowly in 1948. I think the operative context for our discussion today as we toggle between past and present is you know, that, that presidents since the civil rights movement and since LBJ have reckoned with race, have used race to uh, forge electoral coalitions uh, to carry them into the White House, whether they are concerned about the white electorate or whether they're concerned with capturing enough of the black vote to put them over the top. Great, and um, just, just to put a finer point on it um, uh, and to add to what you just said, right? The Democratic Party in 1948 is, you know, a mixture of those, you know, of Northern and industrial um, labor and working class voters, but plus the South, right? So when, when Truman is making that calculation, he's giving something up real, right? He's, he's, he's having to choose between um, trying to go after that Northern and Midwestern black vote or trying to keep the kind of white Southerners in his party, right? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, um, Truman's support for civil rights sparks a, uh, an exodus of uh, the, the Southern Democrats, the pro-segregation Democrats out of the party and Strom Thurmond uh, leads, uh, runs for president on the state's rights party. Uh, so it's, it's a, another uh, sort of third party challenge. Yeah. Well, I think these were the Dixiecrats and this was actually, I, I think in my reading of it was that Truman had something of a miscalculation at that time. He was expecting to be challenged on the more progressive end of things because it was a four party election in, uh, in 48. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think he counted on the uh, Southern uh, wing of the party being as defiant uh, and resistant as it was. And that actually has important implications, I think, for later, uh, because uh, notwithstanding that long democratic commitment in the Deep South, boy, when you started dealing with questions of race, uh, it was uh, truly a, a third rail of politics. And uh, that's something that we've seen tracking on through today. So I want to I want to move us up in a minute, but uh, I'm going to take up your invitation, uh, Russell, and and offer something in this earlier period from my own work, which is, um, and I'm curious the ways in which this I'm imagining will follow through um, our conversation. But um, you know, if you think about FDR, who really was quite concerned during the New Deal and the war to keep the Southern wing of his party, uh, you know, in 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 the coalition and um, and you know left. Um, blacks out of a lot of the protections of, of New Deal legislation in order to keep the, the white Southerners in the coalition. Um, he nonetheless, you know, and I think this will be something that comes out, right? He nonetheless did certain kinds of things um, that, that flew a little bit more under the radar. So, you know, one of the things is, you know, within administrative uh, agencies. So the Department of Justice under FDR creates its first civil rights section that later becomes the Civil Rights Division is now a major piece of the Justice Department, um, but at the time had seven lawyers in it, but they were, they were taking cases, they were, you know, uh, uh, they were, were, um, uh, you know, enforcing criminal laws against white Southerners, but they were very small, uh, they were fairly, you know, under the radar, and they weren't challenging Plessy, they weren't challenging uh, the big picture items, they were doing quite small interventions really along the edges of the most brutal um, pieces of, of, of the Jim Crow South. So my, my guess is, and you can respond to this or we can move closer in time to the present, um, up to you. But my guess is that we'll see that a lot where presidents are not directly taking on um, uh, the major issues but are kind of fiddling around the edges or finding ways to intervene that are, are less substantial. I'm tempted to, to just mention that FDR uh, certainly wanted to uh, keep a low profile on those uh, issues of civil rights, but he did issue the executive order 
uh, in uh, 1941 on, you know, uh, that, that basically uh, banned discrimination in uh, federal defense, federally uh, uh, subsidized defense industries. Uh, and he did so um, from, you know, after pressure from uh, civil rights and labor leaders uh, like Walter White of the NAACP and A. Philip Randolph uh, of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Right, I, that was, I, I would have echoed the, exactly the same point, Kevin, that, that what you see with FDR is repeated over and over again, that uh, when, when presidents are moving in the direction of civil rights, it's usually because they're being pushed to do it. It's, it's not because they're doing it out of the generosity of their heart. Uh, uh, Philip Randolph, in particular, at a time when uh, mobilization for the war was an existential issue in the United States, he was saying, Mr. President, if you don't cooperate here, we're going to create problems for you. And that's the kind of pressure presidents will uh, ultimately uh, you know, see fit to make accommodations with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move up in time. So you both mentioned uh, the 60s. Uh, and, you know, my sense is uh, LBJ is the real turning point. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know who of you wants to, to, to start talking about this modern era. Why is that the turning point? What happens then? And what is it a turning point to? Well, LBJ is a turning point because he is the president who got major federal civil rights and voting rights legislation done. Uh, he, he is reported to have said when he signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that we just lost the South for, a gener for generations. And what he meant by that was that he anticipated, and rightly so, that uh, you know, pro-segregation white Democrats would be so angered by the Civil Rights Act that they would defect to the Republican Party. And that process of, uh, of a, a transformation uh, was, was really underway. A lot of uh, folks associate the GOP courting of disaffected white Southerners who are upset by civil rights reforms. Uh, a lot of people sort of uh, uh, you know, describe that as the GOP's Southern strategy. Um, the Southern strategy, I think, had been even uh, beginning before that with the, uh, the, the presidential campaign of Barry Goldwater in 1964. Goldwater had opposed the Civil Rights Act. And interestingly enough, one of uh, Goldwater's leading surrogates uh, was the uh, aspiring Republican Party politician, Ronald Reagan, who uh, I think really sort of projected himself as a force to be reckoned with in GOP politics uh, through his uh, speaking uh, and campaigning on behalf of Barry Goldwater. Right. But yes, the, the Voting Rights Act, obviously, you know, bringing African Americans uh, into uh, political participation, ability for elective office, you know, that's really a, a game changer. It really sort of creates for the first time, well, or, or at least for the first time since Reconstruction, the United States as truly a liberal democracy. Okay. Right. And, and again, Kevin, this is an instance where presidents are being pushed by civil rights activists who are actively out trying to create circumstances that presidents can't ignore. This begins somewhat under John Kennedy, but it's certainly true with the Civil Rights Act and then with the Voting Rights Act. And, and just for uh, people who are watching, uh, I would encourage you, uh, it's really easy to find uh, Lyndon Johnson's speech from uh, March 15th, uh, 1965, um, is remarkable. It's uh, the place where he embraces the mantra of the civil rights movement, we shall overcome. You can actually, you can watch uh, uh, videos of uh, this speech and you get the sense when you, when you look at this president from Texas and it's striking, if you haven't heard Lyndon Johnson in a long time, if my accent sounds a little bit Southern, I'm from Alabama, he's Texan and, and, and that thick Texas drawl uh, is almost impossible to hear these days uh, on on television. Uh, uh, it still exists, but not uh, you know among people you're going to see much on TV. Listening to Johnson talk about the importance of racial equality in America, you're just convinced that a permanent change has to have taken place at this moment in time. He's giving this speech only three or four days after John Lewis and people are beaten at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. So again, you see this interaction between civil rights activists 
pushing presidents to do things that they, ought, that, that they otherwise wouldn't do because they feel under a compulsion morally and politically to do so. So is it a permanent change, uh, right? It, it, does this turn out to be something that continues or what happens in the, the presidencies after this? Well, I mean, maybe we should just skip ahead to, uh, to the Reagan administration and the Reagan-Bush administration, uh, which dramatically changes American politics. Um, the Reagan administration and its, uh, his successor, uh, George H.W. Bush, were um, openly opposed to civil rights reforms. And really the conservative movement and the new right had, had altered how uh, even the issue of race and civil rights was discussed. And uh, conservatives used language like, um, you know, uh, calling civil rights reforms or civil rights inform, uh, enforcement measures, reverse discrimination, um, or you know, talking about racial preferences. And so it really, um, it, civil rights activists and African-American uh, uh, members of Congress, the Congressional Black Caucus are on the defensive during the, the Reagan administration in defending civil rights. Uh, and, and some issues that, uh, civil rights issues that came up during Reagan really sort of showed uh, Reagan's willingness to, to, to openly oppose civil rights. Um, he had uh, issued an executive order calling for uh, the waiver of uh, uh, a, uh, uh, he, he, he basically uh, changed the laws so that uh, institutions, private institutions that discriminated uh, in the South, like such as Bob Jones University, uh, in South Carolina, which was an all-white Christian institution that banned interracial dating and, uh, you know, was, was closely identified with racial discrimination, or the, the whites-only segregation academies in the South. Reagan issued an executive order um, basically um, waiving uh, 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 their uh, tax-exempt uh, status. So he, he, he basically uh, said that it's, it's okay for these, these, these institutions to discriminate uh, and not have to worry uh, about uh, paying uh, federal taxes. So, um, and Reagan also did uh, some things that really uh, mobilized civil rights opposition. His nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court in 1987. Uh, Robert Bork was uh, a, uh, this was back in the days when uh, Supreme Court nominees were open about their uh, political views. And uh, Bork had, uh, he was a legal scholar, had an extensive uh, record of scholarship in which he basically said that the Brown decision, Brown v. Board of Education was wrongly decided. Uh, he basically said that Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided. And so you can imagine a, a sort of a mobilization uh, against Bork's candidacy. And um, Bork was, was defeated. His nomination was defeated, I think 58 to 42. And uh, even Republicans uh, joined uh, the, those who, who voted against him. So um, Reagan really felt uh, uh, angered and, and wronged by that. Uh, he, he really felt that uh, people who were uh, raising this issue of civil rights were just not raising a legitimate issue. Um, and, you know, we can talk a little bit more about uh, Reagan's politics. He was forced uh, by bipartisan congressional support to sign the, uh, the bill making Dr. King's birthday uh, a, a, a federal holiday. Uh, but uh, Reagan had initially very strongly opposed that. Russell, do you have anything to add there? Not really. I, I, I think the only, um, the only comment I would make is, is that I do think that until, I mean, we'll, we'll get to the current situation uh, before we close. I, I think that there has been uh, in the aftermath of 1965 that there was uh, a, a, a fairly permanent change, if not in policy, uh, at least in a fundamental commitment to the idea of racial equality that had not existed before. And that that was largely reflected at a minimum in presidential rhetoric. And words sometimes are cheap and it's really easy for Reagan or others to occasionally offer uh, an olive branch to um, uh, uh, minority Americans verbally in ways that they would not through policy. I 
it's not unimportant, but it doesn't do anything to, um, uh, to, to minimize the importance of the kinds of policy matters that Kevin has just addressed. Um, so, so I have a couple of thoughts, and then going to engage you both. But one in the in the question and answers, they asked for um, a, uh, you to say the LBJ speech. What what is it? How would people find it? Um, it, uh, it and and maybe somebody who can put that in the chat. I don't know if that's right, but maybe someone could put that in the chat. Um, easy to find. We, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's easy to find if you Google LBJ March fifteenth, nineteen sixty five. Great, perfect. Um, so the second thing, uh, this is just a small aside because we're not talking about the court, which we could easily be doing, but we're talking about um, the presidency and race. But, you know, the Bork nomination and what happened there is, you know, um, one of the cautionary tales for why we now have confirmation processes where our, uh, the nominees don't uh, say all that much. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and his was a, a real lightning rod, I think, of, 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 um, uh, of a confirmation where... Uh, People were talking about their views and, uh, and it didn't go well. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to put that as an aside. But th the other thing I'm thinking about, and I do think this is gonna um, uh, keep as a, as, a, as a theme probably is, you know, when you think about the role the presidency can play, there's um, you know, opposing movements for change um, or, or ignoring them, right? There's embracing them and propelling them forward. Um, and there's, uh, uh, using them as a, a political um, uh, wedge, right? Or, you know, I, and I think part of what Kevin was maybe getting at with the kind of rhetoric that he was talking about with President Reagan is by using phrases like reverse discrimination, by using phrases like racial preferences, um, he was suggesting that there are other losers here, right? He was trying to create division um, and not merely say yes or no to the, the goals of, of civil rights advocates, but to point out um, where their goals could be seen as, you know, creating harms for others, for people he wants as his, you know, political um, supporters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Reagan yeah. begins. Reagan began his 1980 campaign, uh, uh, the general election campaign in Mississippi, uh, near where um, you know the civil rights workers had been killed. The people who, who who are attentive to these things understood exactly what he was doing, uh, and so uh, you're you're exactly right. It, it's it's interesting though. Again, I think this is is probably to some extent a testament to the advances in the 1960s that. This uh, no longer is overt as it used to be. You now have to go through these sort of subterranean ways of communicating because it's not considered appropriate behavior or hasn't again until fairly recently to overtly say you're on the side of people who are opposed to um, uh, movements for racial equality. Well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned Reagan's uh, uh, decision to announce his campaign in the Deep South and to proclaim his support for states' rights, which uh, civil rights advocates and many African Americans clearly saw as an ominous sign. And you know, Reagan was running against Jimmy Carter, the incumbent. And when Carter uh, opined after Reagan made that uh, an announcement in Philadelphia, Mississippi, that uh, he was for states' rights, Carter said, "Maybe Reagan has a racist streak," and the, the press did not pick up on that. If anything, the press defended Reagan and they said, well, maybe Jimmy Carter has a mean streak. So, I mean, there, there's, we're talking about a, a political climate in which um, it's seen as acceptable within the GOP to make these kinds of uh, insinuations that are racialized and, and designed to, um, to divide the sort of the traditional Democratic New Deal coalition, uh, you know, to peel off not only the, the white Southerners, but also uh, Northern white workers, uh, you know, in the Midwest. Um, I, I think the press and politics, I think that was just kind of the, the, the rules of the game. And it, it really sort of reshaped American politics going through the, the Reagan and Bush administrations and even into the Bill Clinton administration where there is that kind of subtle pandering to, you know, the, the white electorate. 
So, so I, I, I want to come to the, the Clinton administration in a minute, but one of the other kind of, um, I don't know, uh, levers that presidents can pull, right? So there are policy changes or decisions not to change policy. There's politics, there's rhetoric, um, and there's also personnel, uh, right? There, there are visible symbols of, uh, of embrace um, that, you know, that might be another way that presidents are, uh, are thinking about that. So you think about um, the 1980s, Clarence Thomas, Colin Powell, Condoleezza, into the 90s, Condoleezza Rice, right? Um, so how far does that go? How important is that? Is that, do you, do you both see that as window dressing? Do you see that as, you know, fundamental and important? H how do those kinds of um, uh, appointments play, play a part? I think, I think um, the new right got a lot of political mileage out of promoting the careers of uh, Black conservatives like Clarence Thomas, uh, Colin Powell, and Condoleezza Rice. I think that it really, um, it, it, it gave the impression that this was an inclusive party. And, and you know, it was quite significant for uh, these officials to receive such high level uh, appointments. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, the Clinton administration responded. I think Carter was, was noteworthy uh, in, from 1976 to 1984. Um, appointing more African-Americans in high-level posts in his administration. But um, I think it, I agree, Risa, it's, it's, it's pretty symbolic at the end of the day, but um, it, it does, you know, uh, deflect or allow the GOP to deflect uh, the criticisms that might come from some of its anti-civil uh, rights policies. Um. Before, before we get to the Clinton administration, which I want to, I want to ask one of the questions that has come in over the transom. So Paul Spence asks, beyond African-Americans, what are the major or lack thereof milestones in presidential leadership and Asian-Americans or Latinx Americans? Well, the, the history on, uh, on, on Asian-Americans can't be told without reference to World War II. And that's the you know, that's the instance of, of uh, internment, and it's a you know it's a it's a shame on the uh, on 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 the American presidency. It's something that uh, I think we I think we formally apologize for, I believe. Uh, but it was um, again Roosevelt acting, uh, I think, in what he felt was the national security interest of the country at the time. But um, it's hard to tell the story of uh, America and minority rights without acknowledging uh, that awful episode. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's also interesting to note that uh, President Reagan signed legislation in 1988 uh, that had uh, issued a formal apology for the internment of Japanese Americans and Japanese nationals during World War II, and that actually uh, devoted uh, uh, funding to uh, reparations for uh, families who were involved. Many of these uh, Japanese Americans who were US citizens uh, lost their homes, were uh, dispossessed of businesses and land. And um, so, it's one of those rare examples where uh, the U.S. government apologizes for um, something that is is widely perceived as a sort of a historic uh, uh, crime against humanity. Kevin, do your research have have anything on on Latin uh, Latin Americans? I, the the only thing that comes to my mind on that is is actually nineteenth century, and again, it's consistent with. Um, with the argument that I was making about uh, uh, abolitionism, that uh, the uh, uh, rights of, of uh, Mexicans and Mexican Americans were were terribly treated with respect to Texas, and Texas was an important uh, uh, implement for those people who were trying to advance uh, pro-slavery interest at one point. There were very active efforts on the part of the United States government to. to to acquire taxes, and there are horrible stories about uh, treatment of, of uh, Mexican Americans at the time. I'm I'm less familiar with the 20th century history, and so can't comment on it. Well, I mean, other than the occasional uh, symbolic uh, 
uh, or more or less symbolic appointment to a cabinet official uh, office. I believe um, Bill Clinton had uh, appointed Henry Cisneros as the, the secretary mm -hmm. of, of, of HUD. And, um, and I, I believe was, was it the Bush administration that uh, appointed Linda Chavez as secretary of labor. So, I mean, other than those kinds of, uh, those gestures towards uh, a, a Latino constituency, um, it's, it's difficult to think of any kind of um, legislation on the level of, of the, the civil rights uh, legislation to, sh to safeguard the rights of African-Americans that we've been talking about. Um, but, but that is an interesting question. I mean, Latinos are a force in politics more perhaps at the local level through mobilizations around, uh, you know, Chicano rights, Latinx rights um, in, in the 1970s. Uh, of course, Cesar Chavez, uh, uh, Dolores uh, Huerta are involved in the uh, farm workers movement, but this, these are more sort of outside of the political system uh, and the political process. Uh, of course, there's Justice Sonia Sotomayor, right, uh, as well. But there, there are there are others. But you know, and I, I, I would, I would just add. I think um, the the Latinx often gets uh, addressed through immigration issues, right? I, I think that's it's not there's not a one to one correlation there, but I think that's a big place where um, uh, Latinx communities and advocates have been interacting with the federal government, not always with the president. Uh, himself, though sometimes that, but uh, but certainly I think that's a big locus of uh, conflict and tension and uh, and politics, mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't always it doesn't all point in one direction either, right? But that's certainly a, a locus of it. Um, so somebody asked uh, Glenn Gray Glenn Gray asked in the chat um, what if any opposition there was to the World War II internment of Japanese at the time. I mean, my sense of this, but you all can say more is. Uh, exceedingly little. Um, and even the ACLU was dis divided. There were ACLU lawyers who uh, defended uh, Japanese Americans, but, um, but that was even controversial within the ACLU uh, and the ACLU itself was divided. So my sense of it is there wasn't, there wasn't, there weren't very many people uh, standing up to defend uh, Japanese Americans, but, but I don't know if either of you have a, a different view of that. No, I think that's, yeah, I, I just don't remember seeing very much uh, uh, opposition uh, through reading the Black Press during World War II. No. I, I suspect if you dig hard enough, you'll probably find somebody uh, who voiced reservations, but it certainly was not the prevailing view. He was operating, and this is, this is, you know, sometimes the hard thing about examining history in any sense, and, and presidential history in particular, is that, um, Roosevelt was following the prevailing uh, uh, winds of the time and they, they're unfortunate. Uh, it, it makes it that much more complicated to issue a historical judgment about what he was doing because of the fact that there wasn't, a, uh, wasn't much guidance to do anything other than what he was doing. Um, I, yeah, I, I would... Um... I would add, I, I just, I had a train of thought and I lost it, it's back again. I, I would add, you know, I think that today we, we tend to, and we don't do this you know, you know, uniformly, but I think there's a greater sense today of racial minorities or underrepresented groups that, that is a little flatter um, and, and thinks about groups. Actually, I think we've moved away from this now lately, um, thinking about BIPOC and, uh, and, and we're, we're re-disaggregating. Um, but I think for a long time, you know, there's a sense that, that, that we think about minorities as a group. And when you look at what was going on in the 40s, um, there were lots of folks who were, um, going back to the earlier history Kevin was talking about, who were pro-Black civil rights, who were virulently anti-Japanese racist, right? They were, you could really see, nobody thought of Black Americans and Asian Americans or Japanese Americans as, as at all parallel in any way. And obviously all throughout, you know, there's a great book by Mark Brilliant about um, uh, race in, uh, in this period that talks about lots of different groups and the ways which they are not parallel and they've never been parallel. Um, and we overemphasize, 
overemphasize the parallels, but I think especially when you look in the 40s, I'm always struck by the disjuncture of growing support for black civil rights at the same time and by the same people who are just virulently uh, anti-Japanese. What about women, Risa? What about them? Well, I mean, uh, I, I, I think the point that I'm that I'm trying to make is that is to echo what you've just said. Does yeah. we we find our our way of disaggregating um, uh, those who are uh, underrepresented uh, or those who are being discriminated against? And uh, we haven't talked about women, so I thought it, it it worth raising the issue to see if it isn't relevant to this particular part of the discussion. Hmm. Uh, I I think. And you know, you're you're bringing up women raises this question of the comparative stat, which I think Risa just commented on, which is today we think of a certain kind of equivalence in the status of African Americans, other racialized minorities, women, um, you know, LBGTQ people, but that was not the case in this period. Um, the the major issue um, at this time, and that's not to say that they're they're there weren't these movements, perhaps on a local level, um, but the, the major issue that kind of defined American politics in the post-World War II era was the issue of civil rights. And the demographics of the country were, were, were quite different. It's not until the post-1965 immigration that you have this tremendous expansion in the immigrant population uh, of, of immigrants from uh, Southeast Asia, uh, from Asia. I mean, the, the 1965 Immigration Act removed those racial barriers to, uh, to immigration that had been established by the 1924 Immigration Act, uh, which had basically banned non-white immigrants uh, from, from, from the United States. So the, the kind of multi-racial, multi-cultural society with a, a vibrant feminist movement and a LBGTQ uh, rights movement, you know, that's a little bit into the future, and and the, the 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 divide around civil rights is usually African American civil rights versus you know white uh, segregationists who want to maintain the status quo. Right. So while we're we're talking about the the multicultural nature, um, a couple more questions about that, and then we can zoom back out and and make some more comparisons today and and more recent history. Um, but so two more questions from uh, from the audience about this. So one is, how do you see this from Nancy O'Brien? How do you see the treatment of Native Americans throughout this history and discussion of minority rights? There's a moment in the. Um the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, in which the Black Power Movement and the Black Power Movement is uh, sort of a latter phase of the civil rights struggle, uh, what, what uh, Russell referred to earlier as the long civil rights movement, spanning from say, you know, the World War II era to the deep well into the 1970s, um, in, in which there is uh, a, a sense of the importance of building coalitions between African Americans and other um, racialized groups with histories of, of racial oppression. And so you see alliances um, and, and really a lot of sort of sharing the same kinds of political rhetoric, uh, alliances between say the Black Power Movement, and uh, the um, American Indian Movement, um, Asian American movements, uh, Chicano rights, and, and there's, a, there's a, a declaration for, um, for sort of cultural autonomy, a declaration for recognition of, of past histories of, of uh, oppression and exclusion. And, uh, and, and there is this, this, uh, this sense of forging coalitions, not only between these uh, oppressed groups of color, but, but, uh, but white radicals uh, as well. Um, and so you do have in the 1970s um, protests by Native Americans, you know, um, seeking um, sovereignty, increased sovereignty, um, fishing rights, et cetera, um, and, and African American activists joining in solidarity with, with, those, with those protests. 
well, I, I think the uh, the 19th century history um, sort of uh, on on uh, Native Americans replicates what you're seeing with with Black Americans. That uh, there's a tendency to not to think very much about what presidents were doing when, in fact, if you look at it very carefully, uh, what you're seeing is you know presidents who are very much actively engaged in using their powers sometimes in surprisingly creative ways to uh, uh, impose on uh, Native Americans. And um, I don't think that you've seen, I mean, Kevin, I'll, I'll defer to you on this uh, because of what you just said. I don't think you've seen the, the sort of emergence of a, uh, of a force creating mechanism in the way of a social movement among Native Americans that has anything uh, or that, that approximates anything on par with what was happening in the civil rights movement. And in the absence of that kind of, of uh, action forcing process on the presidency, you accordingly haven't seen the same kind of activism on, on the part of presidents to support uh, rights for Native Americans. So, so um, we have a couple more questions on this, um, um, uh, but I, I know people also really want to hear you all, you know, compare uh, the present moment to these past moments that we've been talking about. So um, let me ask one more and then I'll hold off on the other one for now. So the, the one more to ask right now is how is the analysis affected by increasing recognition of the inexorable force of demography, whites becoming the minority and the presidency seen as a tool of entrenching power? That's from Gail Kitch. And maybe that brings us, that might be a good segue to bring us to this moment and the racial politics that we're seeing today and how they compare to those that we've seen in the past. So I think that that, that, that demography uh, that Gail is referencing is clearly part of the, the political calculation that we're, and, and the, the political rhetoric, the political calculation, and the political context that we're in right now. Well, you remember after the 2012 election and uh, uh, Barack Obama's reelection, uh, his defeat of, of Mitt Romney, the GOP uh, nominee. And the Republican Party did an autopsy of the election and, and the finding uh, of, of this uh, account as a sort of a path forward for the GOP was that the Obama coalition reflected these changing demographics, a shrinking white electorate. I mean, the, the white electorate must have been something um, over 70% in uh, the the days of uh, Reagan and Bush, and it, it was you know, shrinking. And there was, um, based on the, the forces that we've been talking about, post-65 immigration. Um, and so the, the GOP had decided that they were going to have to do more outreach to um, voters of color, African-Americans, Latinx voters, et cetera. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, we, we talked about the GOP outreach a little bit, to, um, to African-Americans and other uh, uh, folks from other minority groups through these appointments of you know, Condole Condoleezza Rice and, and Colin Powell and, and others. The GOP basically did not, obviously did not follow through on the findings of that autopsy that it was really necessary for the Republicans to, to do this outreach to, to voters of color if they wanted to be competitive in national elections. And they, um, they doubled down on, um, you know, trying to mobilize white voters as white voters. And there was nothing subtle. There was nothing um, coded about that at all uh, through the campaign of, of, uh, of Donald Trump. So, um, and then there's also the, the African-American vote. I think that the African-American vote in 2016 was, was far less enthusiastic as we saw for uh, Hillary Clinton uh, than it had been in the Obama elections. And, um, you know, that, that combination of really sort of uh, mobilizing white voters as white voters and uh, the, the difficulty and even failure of the Clinton campaign to uh, engage voters of color and to, and to sort of carry forward that Obama coalition uh, really explains the uh, improbable rise of, of Donald Trump. Russell, anything to add? I don't think so. I, I, I think Kevin nailed it. 
So can you take us back a little bit? Let's 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 triangulate from how far we went up and now coming back. So talk a little bit more about, you know, this administration following on to the Obama and the Clinton administrations from from what preceded it immediately. How, how do you how do you think about these three presidencies and their interactions with race and where you see commonalities? Are there commonalities or 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 is it all difference? I'll just, I'll just say that the Obama administration ended the dog whistling. It, you know, Lee Atwater made a, a notorious statement about the Southern strategy, that instead of openly race baiting, you would talk about certain issues that uh, would, would have racial connotations to the white electorate, like busing or taxes, et cetera. And that kind of um, uh, sort of dog whistles that, you know, really, really ended with the Obama administration. And you saw the Tea Party, which um, I think a lot of the defenders of the Tea Party really wanted to sort of insist that it was about, you know, uh, limited government or controlling spending. But, you know, there was a, you know, a, a pretty unmistakable uh, anti-Black uh, animus to the Tea Party movement um, and opposition to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and a lot of that opposition uh, was, was based on the fact that African-Americans were going to be beneficiaries of the program. And so many whites who would have benefited from the Affordable Care Act oppose the Affordable Care Act on, you know, just their sense that it's just not legitimate to uh, invest federal resources in those people um, that, uh, that they despise. So um, obviously you can sort of see the clear segue between the Obama administration and the Trump administration. As for the, the Clinton administration, I think that the um, Hillary Clinton may have suffered the consequences of some of uh, her husband's more um, problematic policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis African Americans, uh, welfare reform, the crime bill. Um, although even though Clinton did uh, stand up for issues of civil rights, he defended a, a affirmative action uh, you know, against withering attacks from the right. Um, the fact that Hillary Clinton if she had managed to have a little more daylight between her position uh, and Clinton's position on say the crime bill, you know, if she had been Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> you know, and, and had, uh, you know, more of a, uh, an independent demeanor on, on these issues of civil rights, you know, leaving Franklin Roosevelt to basically, you know, throw up his hands and say, you know, I, I'd like to help you, but I can't help you because I don't want to you know, offend the, the Southern segregationist bloc of the Democratic Party. If Hillary had managed to carve out a more independent space on those issues around race and crime, I think she might have done better uh, in 2016. I mean, that's obviously just pure speculation. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to come back and, and spend a whole session sometime just dissecting Bill Clinton on race because they're fascinating polarities in there. We really don't have a chance to get into it, but I'd love to hear Kevin uh, and, and you too, Risa, talk more about this, about the, the, uh, the origins of the crime bill. I'm sure there's a lot I could learn on that. That's a whole program. It is. It is. So let, let me ask, there's a, there's a question that I think um, is, is a, we're, we're coming to the end. So in a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you both to sort of give your final thoughts, but there's a good question, I think, as the penultimate from John P. Smith, who says, is the failure of the Republican Party to adopt the broadening of their demographics more attributable to the hostile takeover by Donald Trump or their lack of commitment to inclusion? So I think the question is really, is, 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 the, is what we're seeing today a result of Donald Trump's politics, which have become Republican Party politics, or are they really a result of Republican Party politics separate and apart from, from the current leader of that party? You know, that, that, that's a really interesting question. And I, I have found some of the most uh, fascinating and insightful criticism of Donald Trump to come from the never Trumper Republicans. And there are many uh, very strong Republicans, people who supported George W. Bush, for example, who have openly confessed that um, what they see with Donald Trump is the natural offshoot of uh, developments that they unwittingly had helped to support uh, during the course of their lifetime with the Republican Party. So I'm, I'm not making that claim on my own grounds, but I'm rather 
citing those people who are insiders in the Republican Party, who have examined their souls and come out feeling that um, some of what they're seeing with Donald Trump anyway is a natural outgrowth of developments that preceded Trump rather than a Trumpist takeover of a Simon Pure party on race. Yeah, I, I agree. And I would add that, you know, the, the, uh, the fate of the California Republican Party is instructive. In the 1990s, the California Republican Party um, pushed ballot initiatives outlawing affirmative action in uh, the state's universities and pushed anti-immigrant uh, initiatives that would deprive um, immigrants of social services. And what, what that did was as more immigrants, you know, became citizens and became voters, um, the, the constituencies uh, of people of color in California basically did not see any kind of viable uh, future with the, with the Republican Party, did not see the Republican Party, um, to, to put it mildly, representing their interests. And so um, that's why the, uh, California is a strongly democratic majority state, uh, that, that the, um, the, the anti-immigrant racialized politics of California and the California Republican Party of the 1990s has really sort of created the current uh, strong democratic majority in California. And, you know, that, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say that that is, 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 is going to uh, be replicated in national politics, but but I do think the example of the California Republican Party in the 90s is instructive. Great, so thank you both. Um, we have five minutes left and I'm gonna let you wrap us up. I'll put out a question, but you can ignore it and answer a different one if you'd like. But the way I would put what would be, you know, great to hear from each of you for about two minutes would be, you know, when you look across this whole sweep of the history that we've now been talking about, from whatever vantage point you want to start, um, how different do the racial politics of the presidency today look from what has gone before or how similar? Um, and that's, I think, the, the kind of concluding question would be great to, to talk about. Who wants to go first? But you don't have to. Uh, who wants to go first? I, I'm happy to, to, uh, to take a stab at it. The one thing, right. I mean, there. Look again. We could we could talk for hours uh, about this uh, subject uh, in itself. The one point that I would like to make, and this goes back to the comment that I made about uh, this uh, presidential address by Lyndon Johnson, is that uh, as a as a student of the American presidency over the, over the course of my lifetime, one of the things that that uh, I thought that I had learned that was taught to me over and over again is that presidential words matter. That rhetoric sometimes can be a cheap substitute for action. But when a president of the United States speaks, those words have great currency in the United States and abroad. Probably the single biggest difference between the current president and his predecessor is a difference on this one point. The current president of the United States does not believe in the gravity of his own communications. He is as comfortable speaking through Twitter as he is going before a joint session of Congress, which is fine, but it devalues the currency of presidential communications. And subsequently, it gives him license when he's speaking about things like Charlottesville, to say things that he does not understand has consequences beyond the immediate voicing of his words. And so if I would say one thing about the difference between this president and his predecessor, many other things we could talk about, it is understand the gravity of the words that the president of the United States speaks and therefore the necessity of accommodating uh, these wonderful elements of American inclusiveness that too often have been forgotten in the last three or four years. Well, um, I, I, I can't disagree with that. I think what I would add is that what we're seeing today is 
an overt attack on democracy, an overt attack on voting rights. And African-Americans were the canary in the coal mine for this. In the 2000 election, um, the, the, the swing state of Florida was rife with voter irregularities, voter purges of African-American voters. The, the US Civil Rights Commission found a lot of violations of uh, the Voting Rights Act in Florida in 2000. Um, Americans didn't really care that much. I think a lot of people had sort of, sort of thought that you know, a certain level of voter suppression was baked into the system. But I think we see that kind of um, creeping, um, weakening commitment to voting rights, um, really metastasizing after the Obama uh, administration. And now we have um, the prospect of vast swaths of Americans of all backgrounds uh, at risk of being denied uh, their voting rights and having their votes counted by you know, what is essentially a, a, uh, a rogue um, actor uh, in the White House. So I'm hoping that um, somehow voting rights and democracy will survive this election and that uh, we can move forward uh, and move beyond the kind of uh, racial scapegoating that has defined American politics for uh, way too long uh, in, in, in our society. Thank you both. I wish uh, that we had time to get to all the questions. We missed a couple, but I really appreciate them all. I'm so glad that you all were here and I hope you got as much out of this conversation with Kevin Gaines as, and Russell Riley as I did. Just a tremendous wealth of information and perspectives to think about this current moment. Um, so thank you both for being here and thank you to uh, the Miller Center and to everyone in the audience who joined us today. I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Risa. Thanks, Dr. It was fun. It was. Let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Great. Risa. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Gotta go get a daughter. Fantastic job.